Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, we ask that you would give us ears to hear, that we might receive again, whether hearing this story for the first time or having heard it hundreds of times before, that you would speak to us through your word, convicting us of sin, leading us then to our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. You have a bulletin. It says that our text tonight is from John 19. I would like instead to look at John 18. Since we skipped John 18 in moving through John's gospel, I'd like us to go and cover some of the ground that we miss, and in particular, because John 18, though it doesn't deal explicitly with the upper room, that's in John 13, 14, 15, 16, it does deal with the events immediately after the Last Supper, into the betrayal, the arrest, and then into the early morning and the trial and Peter's denial. And so it fits a bit more with the theme of Monday Thursday and tomorrow looking more particularly at the crucifixion. So follow along. I'm going to read John 18, verses 15 through 27. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. Poor Peter. Of all the disciples, he was the most impetuous, the most prone to extremes. It seems that he either got it all right or got it all wrong. His name was to be a rock, but he was more rocky than a rock. We're not surprised then that of all the disciples, Peter would deny Jesus three times. He was a man, after all, of great highs and equally great lows. It was Peter who got out of the boat. It was Peter who confessed Jesus as Christ. It was Peter who steadfastly promised he would not deny his master. And it was Peter who failed so spectacularly. Three times, three times he has an opportunity to bear witness to Christ, and three times he fails. A servant girl innocently asks him, aren't you one of his disciples? In Mark's account, she says, you also are with the Nazarene, Jesus. And in Mark's gospel, Peter gives a double denial. I neither know nor understand what you mean. John, he says, I don't. Certainly the two responses are uh, not mutually contradictory. He says, I, I, I am not. I don't know the man. In fact, I don't even understand what you're saying. I don't want anything to do with your line of questioning. Then an unnamed bystander asks if Peter is one of the disciples. He says, I am not. And then a third person, here John records, a servant of the high priest says, I saw you in the garden with him, right? And again, Peter denied it. 
In Mark's account, it says Peter invoked a curse against himself, saying something perhaps like, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I am one of those Galileans. Mark says he swore by God's name, I do not know the man. And just then, the rooster crowed, just as Jesus predicted. Bold, brash Peter is reduced to disappointment and disgrace. And we read so poignantly in Luke's gospel, and he went out and wept bitterly. Poor Peter, we might think. So unlike us, we're not perfect, but we certainly would not have denied Jesus three times. We're a bit more steady than that. Ours is a long obedience in the same direction. We're, we're more mature, more dependable, more faithful than poor Peter. Granted, our prayer life is an undisciplined mess. We've not really followed through on any of the spiritual goals we set out for this year. We have all these lofty ambitions for our time in the quarantine, but in truth, it's really meant more yelling and more Netflix. One week, we're ready to lay down our lives for the Lord, and the next week, hmm, we're just kind of bored. So maybe we have more ups and downs like Peter than we thought. Maybe we're a little unstable, a little unreliable, but we think we definitely would not have lied to a servant girl. If she had asked us, are you a disciple of Jesus, we would have simply said, um, yes, I, I am. It's just a harmless question from a harmless person. After all, we're not really afraid of being identified with Jesus. We have bumper stickers and we have signs in front. We'll tell people we're Christians, we follow Christ, right? We would own up to that. But then you think to yourself, I wonder how many people at the office, back when we went to offices, really know that I'm a Christian. And you know, I, I, I can't recall that I've really told anybody in my dorm how much Jesus means to me. And I suppose that when I talk to my neighbors or talk to people at sporting events, I talk about everything else except Jesus. And when I do muster up some courage, I end up talking in very vague generalities about spirituality or the church or believing in God or faith in times like these. I come to think of it, I don't really want to mention the name Jesus. I'm not really sure when is the last time outside of gathering with other Christians that I have really told people about Jesus. So, okay, maybe we are a lot like Peter. We don't verbalize our faith in Jesus, and it's hard for us to state unequivocally, I am his disciple, but we think to ourselves, faith, after all, is a matter of the heart, right? And some of us just aren't quick on our feet. We're introverts. It's just our personality. We're not good with words. We freeze up. We, 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 we can't answer hard questions when we're put on the spot. And even if we can't muster up the courage to admit our belief in Jesus under pressure, well then, it's definitely there in our hearts. We can cling to that. Although, didn't Jesus say somewhere, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? And then there's John 12, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So Before we are too quick to say, oh, poor Peter, poor us, too often, too comfortable, and too cowardly to confess Jesus. Ah, sinful nation, Isaiah says, a people loaded down with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel, turned their backs on Him. 
And in a day where it is easy for us to call upon our nation to repent of its sins, what about us as Christians repenting of our sins? I bet all of us have seen a weather vane with a rooster. But did you know that roosters started out on churches? And the reason that weather vanes got hooked up with roosters is because roosters were on churches and then weather vanes got put on churches because uh, the church steeple was the tallest spot in town. It's where you could show the breezes and where everyone could take a look at it. And so the weather vane and the rooster came together. But the roosters were there first. Why were they there? You still find old church buildings. Some of them will have on their steeple a rooster. And you can look it up online and you can find all sorts of funny conversations. People saying, why in the world does this church in my neighborhood have a rooster? How ridiculous. And there's lots of potential answers to that question. People say, well, the rooster is a sign of vigilance or it points to the dawning of a new day. But originally, it goes back to this story with Peter. And sometime, it was probably several centuries afterward, but Christians began putting the rooster on the church steeple to symbolize and remind us that we ought to be faithful witnesses to Christ in the world, to see in the highest point of the city square a rooster to remind us, always confess Christ, never deny him, be true to the faith. Anytime you hear that rooster crow, anytime you might see it somewhere on a weather vane, or maybe just playing with your grandkids and pulling that little spinny wheel with all the farm animals and it lands on the rooster, you think of Peter. You think of bearing witness. It's why some old Christian writers took the rooster as a sign for the conscience. And what a stark contrast we have here between Peter and Jesus. Often in the Gospels, we have these sort of sandwiches particularly in Mark, but even sometimes in John, we have a sandwich, and like a sandwich, the meat is in the middle. So we have here Peter denying Jesus, Peter denying Jesus, and in the middle we have Jesus bearing witness before the high priest. Lying witness, lying witness, a true and faithful witness. We're meant to see a contrast. Peter, after all of his bravado, shows himself to be fumbling, inconsistent, and Jesus, who will be beaten and crucified, shows himself to be all-knowing and in control. In John 13, Peter asks, Jesus, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. To which Jesus replied, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter like some of us, thought he would be the one to give it all and lay it all on the line for Jesus. And Jesus knew better. Jesus would be the one to lay down his life for Peter. Jesus would remain steadfast while Peter abandoned him. In the face of his lowly questioners, servant girls, Peter is cowardly, timid, denying his master, while Jesus is facing the high priest and the ruling elite of Jerusalem, and he is unwavering, unflinching, denying nothing. Jesus is the true witness, and if we are going to be faithful in our witness, we must start by looking at his. Poor Peter. And yet, many of you will know, that this is not the end of the story for Peter. In John 21, the risen Christ welcomes Peter back as a disciple, and he gives him the command, feed my sheep, three times to match his three denials. In Acts 2, Peter preaches the church's first sermon at Pentecost. In Acts 3, he heals the crippled beggar in the name of Jesus. And in Acts 4, you think Peter had the Holy Spirit? You think Peter had been changed? This man who could not confess before a servant girl that he belonged to Jesus the Nazarene, will declare before the Sanhedrin, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone the builders have rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no other name, for there is no other name among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Yes, Peter said that. And according to church tradition, Peter, in the end, did die for the name of Jesus, being crucified upside down at his request because he felt unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. But Rocky Peter does not become Peter the Rock without Holy Week, without Jesus' passion. Without the shedding of blood, Hebrews says, there can be no remission of sins. And without the death of Jesus, there could be no new life for Peter, no new life for us. Of course, you know there's another symbol that often goes on top of church steeples, and that's a cross. Very fitting, I would say. Now, I think the rooster is it's pretty cool, but only if you realize that there is a cross for every cock that crows. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep, all we like Peter, have gone astray. Have you not gone astray this week? Have you not gone astray in these days in your thoughts, your temper, your impatience, your wandering eye, your lack of faith, your despair? Have you not gone astray in anger? rebellion, unbelief, prayerlessness, have you not gone astray? We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of Peter and Kevin and us all. Though we have denied him hundreds of times, if we turn to him now, if you turn to him now, he will deliver us, he will deliver you. For by his death we live, by his suffering we are healed, by his defeat we triumph, by his rejection we are received. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we confess before you we are more like Peter than we would care to admit. We are at times like Judas selling you out for less than 30 pieces of silver, for 30 minutes of sex, or 30 seconds of rage. We sell you out. We deny you before men and women. And we pray that you would forgive us for Jesus' sake, for the sake of the one who is stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Have mercy. Upon us, O oh Lord, that by his wounds we might be healed. In Jesus we pray. Amen.